And uh, this particular time, I got out of the subway at a place called Christopher Street, Sheridan Square. I had no idea where I was, but I was enchanted with this place. I walked around it, and I spent the rest of the afternoon just walking these streets. Went back in the subway, went back to Brooklyn, and told my sister, hey, I found a place we have to live.
Mm -hmm. that was, uh, actually, the council was created after the law was passed. Uh, according to mine. No. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you would know one better than I. Let's um, see. Well, let's see. Oh, mine. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Well, we must have had the law and created the council only for the rights of the district. Yes. Yeah. 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 Before the council and before the law, was there interaction between the mayoral appointed pre-law commission and the village? Oh, yes. Oh, look here. Yeah, indeed. That was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> that was a, our connection with Blessed uh, Professor James Brother and And he operated dismal quarters down on Broadway where we used to go and help him. Mm -hmm. And at about 4.30 every afternoon he would produce a box of cookies uh -huh. and a little pot of tea and he would say, you must stop, you must sit down, we must have it and save lives. Uh -huh. Tea save lives. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. And of course the wrote for him. That's just sort of a little taste of some of the folks who played such a crucial role in uh, bringing about the designation of the Greenwich Village Historic District. And the three of us, I think, are going to try to give that a little more context. And um, as I get started with my presentation, how many people were also here for the panel we did in January? Okay, so a few, but not everybody. This is mostly not overlapping with that, but you'll see one or two things that are a little familiar. And I also just want to uh, make sure that everybody knows that uh, um, our big celebration this year of the Greenwich Village uh, Historic District 50th is coming on the weekend of April 13th, uh, when we're going to have a big uh, celebration in Washington Square with great performers, speakers, activities for the whole family. And that whole weekend, Saturday the 13th, Sunday the 14th, uh, we'll be having uh, an open house throughout the Greenwich Village Historic District with uh, churches, businesses, synagogues, theaters, uh, schools, uh, opening their doors, having some sort of special engagement with the public so that we can all um, appreciate what makes this district so wonderful. So what I'm going to talk about in my presentation is some of the preservation battles that preceded the designation of the Greenwich Village Historic District in 1969 um, that uh, really spurred people in, in this neighborhood towards seeking this sort of landmark protection and what it is they were up against. Um, this building here, which uh, is probably not familiar to many of you, but used to exist not far from where we are right now, was uh, where 7th Avenue ended at 11th Street. Um, starting in the early 1910s, the city decided that 7th Avenue was going to have to be extended um, all the way down to Varick Street, which it did not use to reach. Um, and that's how 7th Avenue South came into creation. Um, and literally dozens and dozens of buildings in the neighborhood were destroyed in order to make way for 7th Avenue South, which was done for two reasons. One is so that there would be easier uh, vehicular access between Midtown and downtown. The car, of course, in the 1910s was becoming increasingly more ubiquitous. And because they wanted to build a subway line along the west side underneath 7th Avenue and have it go um, connecting Penn Station all the way down to uh, Lower Manhattan. So this is one of the buildings that was uh, demolished to make way for 7th Avenue South. This map here, which dates to, I believe, the 1930s, uh, no, I'm sorry, the 1920s. So this was after 7th Avenue South was extended. So uh, this is 7th Avenue South. So everything that used to be here was a building that was destroyed, and many of them 
them were buildings that people um, fought to try to save, some in vain. The Hess Triangle on Sheridan Square is a sort of emblem of that uh, lost fight. Uh, but this was before 6th Avenue, which was similarly extended in the 1920s, uh, was cut through. So this yellow line here shows you all of the buildings while they still existed that were um, uh, eventually destroyed to make way for 6th Avenue South. Similarly, in order to connect the uh, Midtown to Downtown, 6th Avenue eventually connected to uh, Church Street um, and to run a subway line underneath it. Now this is actually a picture of 6th Avenue when the demolition was taking place in 1926. This is Carmine Street where the 6th Avenue uh, uh, extension began looking south. So you can see this is a really incredible level of destruction uh, that took place, which uh, many in the neighborhood were unhappy about. There were certainly those interests both in the neighborhood and outside of the neighborhood that supported this, but many, many folks um, in the neighborhood were not happy about it. Here's just one example of one of the beautiful historic buildings that was destroyed to make way for uh, Sixth Avenue. This was, uh, in its last incarnation, it was Our Lady of Pompeii Church, um, which was uh, demolished, and that's why we have the new Our Lady of Pompeii Church, which was built in uh, approximately 1927 on Father Demo Square. This was the old Our Lady of Pompeii Church. In the, it was built in the 1840s, I believe, as a Unitarian church, but after that it was the um, St. Benedict the Moor Catholic Church, which was the first black Catholic church in the north in the United States. Uh, and this area was, of course, uh, the Little Africa uh, part of Greenwich Village, um, which was the last remnants of it were pretty much destroyed by the extension of uh, Sixth Avenue. So here's another great building that was destroyed to make way for Sixth Avenue, the Fugazi Theater. There's not a lot of pictures of it. This is the side of it here. This is uh, McDougal Street. This narrow street here is Houston Street before Houston Street was widened and made a, a big wide street. These houses over here, believe it or not, still exist, but in a highly modified form on McDougal Street, north of Houston Street, where Tiro Aseno is. Um, that's what they used to look like before the facades were modified. This was the interior of the Fugazi Theater, and it was built in 1923, owned by a boxing promoter named Humbert Fugazi. Um, it presented moving pictures in vaudeville, and it had uh, 1,687 seats, so it was huge. Um, and it was one of Greenwich Village's most popular uh, theaters, but led a very short life. It was closed in 1929 and acquired by the city for subway construction, comp uh, replaced in 1934 uh, with what is now uh, William Passanante um, Ball Field. And the reason why they did it, so it's interesting, the, the land is still there, but the subway had to make a sharp turn, and so it went underneath this land. And so in order to be able to build the tunnel underneath there, they had to demolish what was on top of it. So that's, uh, that's how we got this ball field. That's why there's a ball field here. Um, and that's why the Fugazi Theater is no longer there. So this is Rhinelander Row, which was demolished in 1937, also very close to where we're standing right now. It was built in 1849 for William Rhinelander. Um, it stood on uh, the west side of 7th Avenue between 12th and uh, 13th Street. One of the things that made it sort of uh, extraordinary was that although it was on standard 100 foot deep lots, they set the row back 40 feet from the street, which was highly unusual. Um, it originally had wooden railings, which in 1886 the Rhinelanders replaced them with these um, ornamental iron railings, which were quite distinctive. Um, in 1927, the New York Times reported that an apartment hotel would be replacing the Rhinelander buildings, uh, but then, of course, the Depression happened, um, and they were not demolished until 1937. Uh, the apartment hotel never uh, resulted, um, uh, but this is what was eventually built on that site many, many years later. Um, next uh, on our list here is the row, and Francis talked about this. Uh, and in his presentation, I'm just going to hit on it very briefly because it kind of fits with the sort of flow of these preservation battles. You know, we think of the row here on Washington Square North between Fifth and University Place as this wonderfully uh, preserved, purpose, per perfectly intact, iconic piece of New York uh, landmark. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize is that all of these houses, till you get to this point here, were actually gutted uh, and destroyed everything behind 
the facade, um, and it was turned into an apartment building. And the uh, only evidence you can see of that from here is that these windows were extended. They used to be the attic windows on the houses to make something closer to a full floor. Um, if you look over here at the houses at the far end, you can see they still have the smaller windows. Um, in 19, and those are still in the form of houses. Um, uh, in 1936, Sailor Snug Harbor, which owned uh, huge amounts of land in this area, um, announced its plans to demolish all of these structures. Um, uh, and uh, there was huge pushback from the neighborhood. Um, and three years later, in 1939, they uh, announced that instead what they would do is retain these facades and sort of build the apartment building into the back of them. So this was an early preservation victory of sorts, not a 100% victory, but certainly a lot more of a victory than the ones that we've seen before. So moving around to the south side of Washington Square, this is 40 to 47 Washington Square South between uh, McDougal and Sullivan Street uh, around 1948. And this was actually something that I only discovered doing the research today. You see the side wall of this building is sort of bare. Um, that's because uh, Sullivan Street didn't originally go all the way up to Washington Square. It was cut through in the 1920s, so a house here was demolished uh, for the to make way for the street. So this look, this is these buildings are not actually in the process of being demolished. This is the leftover from what happened when they tore down this house uh, over here. But what happened here is that in 1946, New York University announced its plans to construct a law center facing Washington Square, uh, which obviously posed a significant threat to the buildings on Washington Square South. Um, there was, again, huge pushback from the neighborhood, um, and uh, there was some uh, victory here. So here is after the buildings were demolished. What was built is Vanderbilt Hall in 1949 in this kind of historicist style, which was highly unusual to do at the time, and in sort of uh, red brick that was kind of meant to be more in character with the neighborhood. The original plans for the building were um, significantly less contextual. So while the buildings were not saved, the replacement at least was uh, something that, uh, as per the wishes of the neighborhood, fit much more uh, in with its character. Uh, then just next to that, we have Genius Row, uh, 61 Washington Square, and the uh, buildings around it. This was this incredible collection of houses on the south side of Washington Square between Thompson and what was then West Broadway, now uh, LaGuardia Place, where uh, a whole range of uh, famous writers lived, um, uh, and that's why it was called Genius Row. Um, and uh, a developer named Anthony Campagna uh, bought the buildings in the 1940s. He was originally planning to build a large apartment building there. Um, he did demolish the building eventually over the objections um, and the great organizing efforts of the neighborhood. There was, in fact, even an effort to buy the buildings and turn them into an art center, which was unsuccessful. Um, the buildings were demolished, but the apartment building never uh, materialized, and instead uh, the land was eventually sold to, sold to NYU, which built the uh, Loeb uh, Student Center there, which was then later demolished to make way for the NYU uh, Kimmel Center in a seeming never-ending cycle of uh, demolition and new construction by our friends uh, at NYU. Um, so, uh, next on our list, this one just briefly, because it also fits the narrative, uh, 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 Francis told this story in, in great detail. Um, the Rheinheimer House is on the north side of Washington Square, 1950 to 1951, a great effort to try to save them, unsuccessful, uh, but what the um, neighborhood was able to get was a change in plans for 25th Avenue so that it was pushed back from the square and the sort of faux townhouse-ish wing uh, was placed on the uh, apartment building um, in a, a more characteristic red brick. Um, now this may seem like a, a minimal gesture to our eyes today, but at, at this time in the post-war years, when everything was about tear it down and build it anew, this was actually a significant um, change. Uh, nevertheless, not preservation of these incredibly worthy historic buildings. Um, here is the Mark Twain House um, and the Hotel Brevoort. This is the east side of Fifth Avenue between 8th Street and 9th Street. Um, these were uh, sadly both demolished in the early uh, 1950s. Um, they were both built um, in the mid-19th century. Um, 
uh, let's see, the uh, Mark Twain House where he lived from 1904 to 1908, designed by the great uh, architect James Renwick, um, and the Hotel Brevoort, among its many other claims to fame, was that its uh, French-born owner, Raymond Ortigue, offered a prize of $25,000 to the first pilot to fly nonstop from New York to Paris. And on June 27, 1927, that prize was awarded at the Brevoort to Charles Lindbergh. Um, that uh, hotel and the Twain House was, of course, demolished to make way for 11th Fifth Avenue, which goes by the name of the Brevoort. And here's the, the entrance to the uh, Brevoort and uh, to the old Hotel Brevoort and the Brevoort apartment building, which exists there now. Then we have Rhinelander Gardens, again, uh, again Rhinelander, and again uh, designed by James uh, Renwick, the architect of Grace Church and St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, another pair of these sort of triple-decker uh, row houses with these incredibly elaborate ornamentation uh, built in 1855. These were demolished to make way for PS41 um, in uh, approximately 1955. Um, here we have the um, uh, Robert Moses' plan for the Washington Square South Urban Renewal Area. So this is the square. This is all of what he planned to do, which goes all the way down to Prince Street, um, and not just on the west side of, uh, not just rather on the east side of LaGuardia Place, but basically all the way to 6th Avenue. So he had very, very, very um, ambitious plans for this area. Um, demolition began around 1955. You can see what this area looked like before the demolition took place, much like traditional village streets, densely woven uh, little buildings. Um, and uh, of course, it was uh, demolished to make way for Washington Square Village, which was built in the late 1950s, and then later in the 1960s, uh, University Village, where Silver Towers was about to put in its place. And then, uh, not content with uh, just that plan, Robert Moses also wanted to um, demolish uh, about uh, 20 blocks in the West Village uh, as well, which he deemed uh, blighted starting in the 1960s and in 1961, including the block where Jane Jacobs lived. So this entire area here bounded by Hudson Street to West Street um, from about uh, Barrow, I believe, to uh, Bank Street up here was slated for demolition to be replaced by urban renewal, towers in the park. In this case, of course, the neighborhood was uh, successful um, in terms of turning back that um, uh, effort. And then uh, last but not least, this one came in kind of just at, at the bell. Um, of course, the designation of the Greenwich Village Historic District came in uh, 1969, but uh, too late to prevent the demolition of the uh, Sheridan Theater, um, which was uh, on the corner of uh, 7th Avenue between 11th and 12th Street, uh, where it intersected with Greenwich Avenue. It was built in 1921. It became a Lowe's Theater uh, in 1926. Um, but as St. Vincent's was planning its expansion, they acquired the site and demolished it, and it was replaced with uh, this building here, um, which of course has since been replaced by St. Vincent's Park and the Aids Memorial. Uh, but we can always remember um, the Sheridan Theater with this wonderful uh, painting by uh, Edward Hopper, which uh, immortalized it. So that just gives you a little bit of the context of what some of the battles were that were going on prior to 1969, each one of which had to be fought one by one with varying degrees of success before the, uh, the neighborhood was able to put in place uh, extensive landmarking measures that, for the most part, prevented this kind of thing from uh, recurring. So uh, thank you very much, and I'm going to ask uh, Francis Maroney to come up. slides to appear. And what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of overlap with what Andrew talked about, um, but I hope not too much. I want to talk about Washington Square. And I want to talk about, as Andrew did, some of what happened uh, before there was a landmark slot, and also about some of what uh, might have happened. And I hope that I'm going to show you some images that you may not be familiar with. Um, this is a pretty familiar image, I think, to anyone who's looked at historic pictures of Washington Square. 
It's not projecting really well. Uh, actually, it's a very crisp image where you can see the buildings in the background, but they're completely washed out uh, in this projection environment, unfortunately. So you're going to have to take my word for it when I tell you what's there. Uh, this is circa 1850. The print is actually undated. Most sources call it circa 1840. I'm inclined to think it's about 10 years later than that. But you see uh, what Washington Square looked like at that time. Uh, clearly, it has an iron fence around it. Henry James describes it in Washington Square as having a wooden fence, as indeed it apparently once did. But this is an iron fence. And this is Washington Square South. This is what Andrew was talking about. And you can see, I hope you can sense through this kind of washed out image that in, like Washington Square North, was at first a very elegant row house street, pretty much the equivalent of Washington Square North, though socially and economically, the fate of Washington Square South would be very, very different from that of Washington Square North. And then along the east side of Washington Square, there were two very large and very distinctive buildings. There was the Washington Square Reform Dutch Church, which may or may not have been designed by Bernard de Fever, but which was one of the earliest Gothic revival churches in New York. And immediately to its north was the original building of NYU. And this is the NYU building, which was designed by the team of Alexander Jackson Davis, Ithiel Town, and James Harrison Dakin, um, inspired by King's College Chapel in Cambridge. It was um, a really great building, which NYU uh, replaced with the building currently on the site, which is Silver Center, with which I'm sure many of you are familiar. This is a wonderful painting in the collection of the New York Historical Society by the NYU fine art professor, Samuel F. B. Morse, who taught in that building. And it really tells us more than any single other image I know about the sort of romantic sensibility behind the neo-Gothic architecture of the NYU building. Morse is saying to us that when you look at this building, it is meant to transport you beyond this dreary, grimy city and uh, to make you fantasize that Washington Square is in fact um, a lake with mountains rising behind it and forests. It's just like a momentary thought that you have that helps get you through your day. That's the purpose of great architecture, is to help you get through the day. Now, another, this is a painting in the Metropolitan Museum of Art by Otto Bedeker, which shows much more clearly than that print that was washed out, the NYU building, the Washington Square Reform Dutch Church, and we see what's meant by parade ground. Remember that Washington Square was originally called Washington Military Parade Ground, where the militia units, what we now call National Guard units, would uh, conduct their precision drills in the days before there were purpose-built armory buildings in New York. Now, in Washington Square now, north, south, um, we have what is today a pretty, and I don't mean this judgmentally, but motley assortment of buildings, uh, one of which is uh, Johnson and Foster's Bobst Library. I know that this is a building that everyone here deeply loves. Uh, it, it's, uh, it was one of the few bits uh, of Johnson and Foster's master plan for NYU. Now, NYU, as you know, is a very large and very complicated institution, and uh, the source of my health insurance, so I don't want to say anything uh, 
two. Um, well, well I, I, I need to tread carefully, but uh, you know that NYU, uh, after it built, its original building was great. Uh, it was also very influential. Uh, some sources actually say that that original building by uh, Town Davis and Dakin was the first collegiate Gothic building in America. Uh, now, that said, from that point on, NYU kind of developed in this very sort of, I guess the uh, nice word would be organic way around Washington Square where they took over pre-existing buildings like a lot of those loft buildings that are to the immediate east of the square which were sort of neatly left out of the historic district in 1969 and they then also constructed a number of buildings and they adopted master plans along the way that would have given had they been realized a coherence to the NYU campus around the square. So Johnson and Foster actually designed, or at least drew pictures, of a whole bunch of buildings around the square that would have given a unified campus identity to NYU had they been built, and thankfully they weren't. Uh, this is on the east side of the square. You can see Bob's Library right there. And this is a real mega structure which would have absolutely, can you imagine this? Dominating, utterly dominating the east side of the square with this gigantic atrium in the center that looked like this on the inside. Uh, so this actually was conceived and designed by Johnson and Foster at the same time as Bob's library and the other buildings of theirs, uh, the Kevorkian Center and Tisch Hall, which were parts of this plan that were realized. But the plan ran out of steam or out of money, and it uh, consequently was ultimately kind of shelved. Uh, this is uh, Washington Square uh, South. This is the block that was purchased by the man whom Andrew mentioned, Anthony Campagna, another very complicated man. He's sort of the bat noir of preservationists in New York because he just had this remarkable knack for tearing things down that people loved. Uh, and at the same time, he was also a, a, a builder of, of some distinction. He built for himself a, a magnificent house in Riverdale, which is one of the finest houses in this part of the country, and which, uh, as Tony said uh, a little while ago to me, uh, the ultimate joke was on Anthony Campagna because his house is a designated landmark. <laughs> uh, but he also built Casa Italiana and Columbia, and he paid for the restoration of Virgil's tomb in Italy. So, you know, guy deserves a place in the Preservation Hall of Fame. Uh, anyway, he toyed these down, and just to add a little something to what Andrew told you, uh, because Andrew did say that the apartment building that Campania wanted to build on the site was never built. Uh, my understanding is that Robert Moses placed a call to Anthony Campania. And he, and, you know, if you're a real estate developer and Robert Moses calls you, you, you take the call. And Moses said, uh, Anthony, this is what I would like you to do. And Anthony said, yes, sir. And Moses said, I'd like you to sell that land at cost to NYU. Now, the reason for this was that Moses was gearing up for the whole Washington Square Southeast Urban Renewal Project. And NYU was supportive of Moses' plans for the area. Moses wanted to throw them a little bone. He wanted to give them this uh, extremely valuable 
site right on the south side of Washington Square, which would provide them with room for expansion. Uh, the only problem was is that NYU had nothing, sh as we say, shovel ready. And they wouldn't for actually many years. And that was just a vacant lot. And those buildings were torn down. And it was just a vacant lot for how long? 15 years? Or, or so. Which is, you know, one of those things that just makes you grind your teeth. <laughs> Ultimately, uh, as Andrew told you, Kimmel Center was built. And, you know, it's Kevin Roach just passed away, and he was indeed a great architect. But he, all, well, you know, I, the thing about Kevin Roach is that I don't know of any architect who was ever given more thankless jobs than Kevin Roach. I mean, almost everything he did had uh, some level of failure built into it before anything was even designed. And, uh, well, so I'm trying to be generous. Okay. And there is that infamous vacant lot. You can, if you're, uh, you know, sort of a dedicated photo researcher, uh, find many images of Washington Square Avenue. Where there's that, just that vacant lot right there. They put tennis courts there at one time. Uh, but it was uh, just a... A mess. This was before Kimmel Center, that's the old um, NYU Globe Student Center and the Catholic Center. These are long, these are now themselves gone. And of course, Eggers and Higgins, who were very talented architects, you know, they uh, both worked for John Russell Pope and they took over his practice when he died. Uh, they were uh, very involved in the design of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and many other great buildings that have Pope's name on them. Uh, and they designed Vanderbilt Hall. Now, leaving aside questions of demolition, um, Vanderbilt Hall is a skillfully designed building. It's a very well-detailed building by architects who knew what they were doing. I mean, it wasn't like that thing that was uh, attached to 25th Avenue, where the architects were just kind of, you know, making gestures. This is a real building. And, you know, when you look at it, you think, wow, you know, NYU, you know, sort of came up with a, a decent building on the square, something that related sensibly to the square, something that, you know, looked collegiate, uh, and so on. Well, uh, what you may not know is that Eckers and Higgins, like Johnson and Foster, about 10 years, 15 years before Johnson and Foster, also did a master plan for NYU, in which they basically surrounded three sides of the square with buildings very much in the idiom of Vanderbilt Hall. Now, had these been built, it would have given, I mean, a coherent visual identity to NYU. It might have actually been, you know, kind of nice, but as you look at this picture, I'm wondering how many of you uh, can see what's not there? Yeah, Johnson Church isn't there. They figured, well, you know, who needs Johnson Church? Uh, so, uh, much as I like Vanderbilt Hall, I don't think that I would prefer Johnson Church to be torn down and replaced with another Vanderbilt Hall. Nonetheless, this is uh, not a terribly well-known image, and it's really quite startling, and it was something that was actually very serious. Everybody knows about Robert Moses' involvement with Washington Square, about the roadway, about the Washington Square South Urban Renewal Area and whatnot, but his actual very first involvement with Washington Square in the 1930s was an attempt to do with Washington Square what he was doing with Bryant Park. Bryant Park and Washington Square were laid out by the same man, Ignaz Pilat. 
And they both had that very sort of homesteadian, um, winding paths and irregularly shaped lawns and whatnot. And in Bryant Park, Moses indulged his own personal preference for a formal garden. And it was done magnificently. He wanted to do the same thing in Washington Square, but got tremendous pushback from the community. This is uh, the plan that his people devised for the layout of Washington Square, and uh, sort of hearkening to what Henry James said about the lamentable arch of triumph in Washington Square. Uh, the, uh, and, and, its, and its lonely, unaffiliated state, Moses' architect, Amar Embry, sought to affiliate it by designing these colonnades that would attach to it on east and west. Now, truth be told, you know, it could be worse. Uh, but, uh, but this was an actual plan on the drawing board at one time. Here's another image of it, and as you can see, uh, this, and this, I think, it looks like the equestrian statue of George Washington in Union Square. I think he was going to move that down and sort of stick it in the middle um, because, you know, we don't have enough statues of George Washington right there. Um, and I thought I would just end up with, uh, you know, every once in a while when you're doing picture research, you just happen upon a gem. And, and I, 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 in soul, soulful Ed Koch, strumming his guitar in Washington Square, um, is, uh, is I'm, I'm sorry, the picture is really neither here nor there as far as what we're talking about, but, but I just can't help showing it. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. And, uh, well, you can't top that slide, so I'm not going to try. In fact, we don't have time for slides, because I'm going to try and give you a sense of what happened that set the stage for the Greenwich Village Historic District which requires revisiting 125 years of preservation history in 15 minutes. So strap on your seatbelts because we are going to do it. There would not have been a Greenwich Village Historic District if there wasn't a Landmarks Law. So we have to go back to the origin of the Landmarks Law because that really sets the stage. So the Landmarks Law originally, back to its intellectual origins, came out of two streams of thought. One, were people concerned about preserving historic sites of associative value, you know, the sites linked to great American figures. And so that was this associative element that a group called the American Scenic Historic Preservation Society started in 1895 as kind of a voice for that. Started by the ever wonderful Andrew Haswell Green, one of the great forgotten New York heroes. The other intellectual stream that started at the same time and not totally by different people, but with a different emphasis, was a concern about aesthetics and the importance of cities being beautiful. So that takes us back to the Chicago World's Fair, the Columbian Expedition of 1893. And all these New Yorkers went to Chicago, saw what a beautiful city could look like, and decided to come home and try and do that in New York City. So groups, all these art societies were created, including the Municipal Art Society in 1893. So the American Seeming Historic Preservation Society, Municipal Art Society, back at the early there, last part of the century, they are part of the narrative all the way to the passage of the Landmarks Law, without which we would not have the Greenwich Village Historic District. So there wouldn't have been a Greenwich Village Historic District without a Landmarks Law. And there wouldn't have been a Landmarks Law without Albert Bard, who resides on my lapel here. So Albert Bard was this incredible figure and back in 1913, he was one of many New Yorkers totally frustrated by something we are frustrated by today, kind of the extreme advertising taking over every inch of the city. And he ended up on a mayoral commission, the Mayor's Billboard Advertising Commission of the City of New York. In 1913, they issued their report on what to do about, land, about excess advertising in New York City. And the response was that there was nothing to do about excess advertising in New York City until 
New York and other cities had the right to regulate proper, a private property on the grounds of aesthetics. So they drafted an amendment to the New York State Constitution that read, the promotion of beauty shall be deemed a public purpose, and any legislative authority having power to promote the public welfare may exercise such power to promote beauty in any matter or locality or part thereof subject to its jurisdiction. Private property exposed to public view will be the subject to such power. Bard was the author of that wonderful resolution, and it took him 43 years before it became law in the Bard Act that was passed in 1965, uh, 1956. So there wouldn't have been a landmarks law without Bard setting that forward and pushing it over the years. There, wouldn't, there also wouldn't have been a landmarks law, and we can debate this with the panel, without Robert Moses. So why do I say that? Well, Robert Moses continually assaulted and energized civic leaders, if you will, for decades because of his approach to the city. So in 1935, that redesign we saw for Washington Square, which was lovingly referred to as the bath mat plan by villagers, he started to antagonize villagers as early as that. But he didn't just antagonize the villagers. He basically assaulted uh, landmarks in parks, and that particularly began to annoy the civic community. And then he went after Lower Manhattan with a proposal to build the Brooklyn Battery Bridge, which led to a huge preservation battle in 1939. And it and the demolition of some key buildings in the parks started the Municipal Art Society to making a list of important buildings. This is in the early 1940s. Moses continued to antagonize people for a decade in the battle over Castle Clinton. He tried to demolish that for 10 years, and it was defended by great civic leaders McEnany, Bard, Stanley Isaac, C.C. Burlingham. And that civic gentry, those kind of great men at that time, and sadly most of them were men because of the power structure, but they began to kind of realize that Moses, who started as a reformer, had gone to the dark side of the force. So they began to see what was going on and thought something needed to be done, hence the beginning of trying to identify buildings to be presented. But Moses didn't stop with that. He also energized Brooklyn Heights because in 1942, he decided to bisect the heights with a highway. They managed to push that off to the side, the BQE, the BQE uh, but he managed to leave behind a lot of very annoyed people now in multiple boroughs. And so he continued with this and, 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 and antagonized the village for years, as we know, with various plans to put the highway through Washington Square Park. But he also continued this and antagonized some of the key leaders in the preservation movement in the 50s and 60s who would ultimately lead to the landmarks law by pushing the Huntington Hartford Cafe in Central Park in 1960. And that antagonized people who would later become the first couple of chairs of the Landmarks Commission. There was also be no landmarks law without the post-war development that was going on in New York. Greenwich Village faced apartment buildings coming in. Brooklyn Heights ex uh, exposed, uh, had the same thing going on in institutional expansion. Uh, Midtown churches were being torn down. So this began to energize people to realize something was wrong. Now the village had realized something was wrong back in the 1940s. In 1945, the village reached out to New Orleans and the Vieux Carre to say, how did you protect your historic neighborhood? And the answer they got wasn't very satisfactory because they had a state, uh, there was part of their state constitution that allowed that to happen in New Orleans. But as early as 1945, the village was saying, we have to do something to protect the village. In 1950, 1950 finally, the citywide sentiment had gotten so strong that the Municipal Art Society, at that time a real advocacy group, announced that there ought to be a landmarks law in 1950. And they were partially motivated by the demolition of the Rhineland mansions that we were just seeing, seen earlier. In fact, a lot of what happened in the village attracted citywide attention because the village was such an iconic part of New York City. So it wasn't just villagers who were fighting, but they successfully reached out to citywide civic groups to kind of jump on the bandwagon to try and save Washington Square Park, try and save these buildings. So that was kind of a larger awareness that's going on. But ultimately, there would have been the landmarks law if there weren't three variables that all managed to be lined up. And those variables included, first, you had to understand what it was people were trying to save. And that started going in 1951 when the Musical Arts Society and the Society of Architectural Historians developed a list which evolved through the 50s 
that became the index of architecturally notable structures in New York, and that ultimately evolved and turned into Alan Burden's book in 1963, and that list guided the early work of the Landmarks Commission. But that provided the intellectual capital. That identified that's what's at risk. And on that list was Greenwich Village and Brooklyn Heights. The second key thing that was needed was you had a constituency who wanted, that demanded political action to save these buildings and neighborhoods that were continually being threatened. So in the 50s, based on that index of buildings, people started to do walking tours, Henry Hope Reed. People started to do exhibitions. But it began to slowly build public awareness. That even grew more in, in 19, between 1961 and the passage of the Landmarks Law. There were over 20 New York Times editorials pushing for historic preservation. Thank you, A. Louise Huxtable, who penned all of those. But this began to create a political constituency saying we need the political will to do something. The third missing variable, and this takes us back to wonderful Albert Bard, was there needed to be a legal basis. There had to be some legal authority for the city, now that there was growing political will, to actually have a mechanism to regulate public property, private property on the grounds of aesthetics, which is really what the Landmarks Law is. And that takes us back to Albert Bard, who starting in 1913, never gave up, never gave up. In the late 40s, he was working with the village, writing, responding to the Via Carre, trying to figure out what can we do. He wrote to Santa Barbara, he wrote to San Diego, he looked nationally for examples, trying to figure things out. Finally, in 1954, he was so frustrated by what was then a threat to Grand Central Terminal that he drafted a piece of legislation that would give New York City the authority to regulate private property. Fortunately, there was a wonderful Supreme Court decision that came down simultaneously saying the same principle, that cities had the right to be beautiful. Legally, they had that right. That then in turn helped propel what's known as the Bard Act. And the Bard Act, which was passed in 1956, finally gave New York that authority that it could protect its buildings if it wanted to. So most of you are saying, OK, let's see, that was 1956, Landmarks Law was 1965. What happened in between? And the, 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 as you're going to see, interest kept growing. And again, the village was a hotbed wanting something done. Brooklyn Heights was now on fire. So Brooklyn Heights and Greenwich Village provided the ground troops for this kind of growing public demand that there be some sort of legal protection. Well, what slowed the process up was in 1956, James Felt, who was not beloved by uh, Jane Jacobs, to put it mildly, became the planning chair and announced he was going to redo the zoning. And so a lot of the civic organizations, people in the village, people in Brooklyn Heights, and these large societies said, this is our chance. We can get historic protection into the new zoning resolution. And they turned up at hearings. There were large gatherings, hundreds of people in the village, hundreds of people in Brooklyn Heights, demanding the use of the Bard Act to protect their threatened neighborhoods. Sadly, in one sense, they tried to push this, they tried to include aesthetic zoning, historic zoning, in the new zoning resolution that James Felt had been pushing for. Felt finally said to them, it's not going to work, guys. Politically, it's hard enough to get reform zoning. But if I put historic preservation in it, it's going to sink like a lead balloon. But if you guys leave me alone and shut up, once I get my zoning through, I will take care of your needs. And he basically delivered on that promise. But the end result was this lag period. And in that period, it's interesting, though Greenwich Village had been pushing the longest for protection, Brooklyn Heights has kind of gotten out ahead of them. And Brooklyn Heights had actually drafted a landmarks law just to protect the Heights, that they were actually out there pushing. So they were really sat upon. And in one sense, that's why they became the first historic district, because they were so far ready to go. And they were basically squashed to just don't push a single district for one part of the city. Wait till we can get a citywide landmarks law. So anyway, all this is stirring up. And finally, uh, after Felt got his new zoning in, he basically, working with preservationists, got the mayor to appoint in 1961 a committee to study what was going on. Maybe something needs to be done. The committee met, made a recommendation, and the mayor then appointed a landmarks commission in 1962, but with no legal powers. And it was charged with two things, identify buildings that ought to be saved and draft a landmarks law. And that's what it started to do. And so it started to do that work, move things along, and then out, we now have kind of the, maybe one of the last straws that had to, to, to break the camel's back to push things through, and that was the threat to Penn Station and ultimately its demolition. And of course, that began to really put a, and kind of the, the, the uh, poster child
for historic preservation. And this, they, it, was, it was demolished over three years while the station was functioning. So it was kind of an in-your-face moment. So that actually began to kind of, again, heat up this, pot, this public demand for something. What's going on? So, this, so the Mayor of Landmarks Commission actually works on a law, drafts a law, puts it on the mayor's desk. Mayor Wagner was not known as a very speedy mayor in making any decisions. In fact, there's a, a, it was kind of referred to as a Wagner School of Decision Making was not to make a decision, just kind of let it take care of itself. Well, that wasn't going to happen because the mayor, the legislation was sitting on his desk, and all of a sudden, in September of 1964, it's announced that the Roqual Mansion is going to be demolished by one Anthony Capagno, just to give him another do in his, in his uh, uh, set, in his sordid path, if you will. And so it was announced in September that the Roqual Mansion was going to be demolished. So what can we do? What can we do? Finally, that moved this draft landmark law to the city council, which held a hearing in December of 1964. So all of a sudden it's now in front of the city council, they're studying it, they're doing its work. And finally in February of 1965, the Brokaw Mansion basically kind of gave its life twice for preservation. It was the threat to the mansion that moved the legislation off the mayor's desk, and it was the actual demolition that then forced the city council, in a sense, to vote and pass the Landmarks Law uh, right after the demolition. The demolition by Mr. Campagna that got a New York Times editorial called The Rape of the Brokaw Mansion really powerful language for 1965. So we now have a landmark law, it's 1965. Why didn't we get a Greenwich Village Historic District right away? Well, first of all, Brooklyn Heights was kind of ahead of the game. They had been kind of promised, if you will, that if they would shut up, they would get their district, and they did. Then there was a focus on Greenwich Village, and Greenwich Village was a much harder nut to crack for the Landmarks Commission because it wasn't as cohesive, it wasn't as homogeneous, it was the rich, wonderful village that we know. And so the Landmarks Commission had to grapple with how they were going to deal with this. And we heard some of this in the last program. So the original hearing in 1965 was a large district for the, for the historic district. But that began to create problems. And I did an interview years ago with Jeffrey Platt, the first chair of the Landmarks Commission, and we talked about this. It's kind of worth hearing what he said. I was very troubled about Greenwich Village because in the first place, we were threatened by some fellow down there. I've now forgotten his name, with a lawsuit if we did anything. And I didn't want to have a lawsuit about Greenwich Village. So the thing that troubled me at Greenwich Village was so many bad buildings. There were, you know, a lot of them. So after a while, Harmon Goldstone and Stanley Tankle and I evolved a scheme of dividing the village into a whole bunch of little districts, collections of the good things. And we tried that out on the Greenwich Village people, and they were smart. We had a hearing on it, and they were very polite and very definite about their feelings about it. They hated the idea. What they said to me in private was just one thing, but they were very smart, you see. Instead of making a big stink, they just made a very good case for not doing it. The corporation counsel at the time, Lee Rankin, he was a wonderful man, he was the one that said, I think you should designate the whole district but you've got to write the most detailed report on the whole Greenwich Village Historic District that you can possibly imagine. You've got to overwhelm them with detail. So Alan Berman spent the next two years writing this report, which came out as two big things like that, and then we voted, and nobody sued us. This thing was overwhelmingly, even though all those bum buildings were still there. That was a terrible problem. Well, with the passage of time, we like those bum buildings. But in any case, Greenwich Village finally got its protection. It took a while. It has probably the most, one of the most extensive designation reports because the threat. And Brooklyn Heights basically had a designation report that's the back of an envelope, uh, Francis perhaps. Uh, but Greenwich Village set a new standard for the quality of work that was needed so that the village would legally stand up to challenges. So that's kind of, in 15 minutes, they rode to the Greenwich Village Historic District. Thank you uh, so much, Tony. So we're going to have a little uh, discussion first, and then we're going to open it to the floor for uh, questions. Jane Jacobs 
what I wanted to ask you was, so she, um, she says that she was only tangentially involved in uh, the landmarking efforts. I think she may have been sort of downplaying her role. I know certainly in terms of pushing to have the district extended as far west as possible. She was very vocal and specific about that. But beyond her direct involvement, how much do you think um, something like death and life of great American cities and the way in which it changed the way we thought about what made cities work, what made them succeed, um, affected the um, uh, movement forward with landmark designation and getting us a landmark law and getting us to actually um, save historic buildings? Well, I think that, you know, uh, we would all agree that part of the background of historic preservation in New York was the urban, urban renewal and what was going on with that in the post-war era in New York, not just Robert Moses, but, but the whole thing. We were seeing whole neighborhoods basically disappearing in the blink of an eye. You know, when you look at something like Stuyvesant Town, which we now think of as sort of a bit of old New York, um, in fact, I mean, a whole huge neighborhood of houses and stores and churches and factories was leveled to make way for Stuyvesant Town, and that wasn't an isolated example. This was happening in all five boroughs, and it was uh, a, a, a plague at the, the time. What Jane Jacobs did, what I think her incredible importance is, not just for preservation in New York, but sort of like in the history of ideas, was to get people to look at what was being destroyed in the name of progress and to realize that progress wasn't progress, that the stuff we were destroying had virtues that many people were sort of inchoately aware of, and she made it coit. She made it, uh, she gave voice to the voiceless and really told us why we should prize what we had and not so wantonly um, get rid of it. It, it was, uh, I think we, we still almost insufficiently appreciate uh, the role she had in just sort of helping to alter people's perceptions of what was around them, and that certainly fed into the mass acceptance of historic preservation. I'd say her role was more kind of Che Guevara in the sense that she was kind of an iconic figure who was kind of willing to be out front and fight authority and take it on aggressively. I think the real impact of the book happened much later. I mean, she was dismissed as a housewife. I mean, the criticism of her book early on was just kind of poo-poo. So I think she's much more appreciated after the fact than at the time that the district was going on. But she really also helped teach the villagers how to be advocates. She was very involved in the emergency committee to, I get the names, there were so many committees around Washington Square, but the one that Ray Rubinow helped organize that ultimately stopped the, the, the highway going through. She was kind of, I think, as I say, the, the guerrilla leader. She really gave those people ideas on how to fight, uh, how to package, how to communicate, how to basically shape issues. So I think she was actually really helpful in building the capacity, if you will, the advocacy muscle in the village that ultimately then led to, you know, to the, the law and, and ultimately to the historic district. So uh, a follow-up question that occurred to me actually as I was listening to both of you talk and sort of further in this vein about Robert Moses. So, you know, one a uh, contextual thing that's very different um, now as compared to in the era that we're talking about is now um, older cities in America, uh, for the most part, or at least in a lot of cases, are, are thriving. Um, there, people want to live there, businesses want to be located there. It's not to say that there aren't problems or issues, but they are growing. Um, at this time, it was kind of the opposite was happening. happening. People were leaving those cities. Um, they were struggling. Um, their future seemed uncertain. Um, and uh, the as ascendance of the landmarking, uh, the success of landmarking, 
in terms of getting a law here, at least in New York, seem to roughly coincide with this recognition that the post-war planning seemed to be doing more harm than good. That a lot of the things that Moses did, the Cross Bronx Expressway, things of that nature, was actually destroying the city, not helping it economically. So I, I'm curious how much you think that might have kind of undergirded the shift in thinking, even though, as you described, Tony, the legal framework was about preserving and protecting the, the beauty of cities and their aesthetic value. Um, do you think that these economic undercurrents in some way might have actually had an equally big effect in terms of how people thought about um, the relative value of these big construction projects as opposed to sort of holding on to what you have for either of you? Uh, I mean, even today, it's still a hard sell to convince people preservation is economically as robust as new construction, and we know it is, but it's still still a hard sell now. So I don't know if that attitude changed, but I do think uh, a colleague of mine, Jeff Crisper, a, a historian, really makes the case that, you know, the revival of New York, you know, we, we saw Mr. Koch up there perhaps uh, looking ahead to the challenge he faced as mayor, of, you know, when the city was really down in the dumps, when you look at how the city began to come back up, it was kind of a neighborhood, the neighborhoods that held on were the neighborhoods that became strong and grew. And that was really the preservation kind of mindset and ethic. Um, preservation's real problem began in the 80s when the city was all of a sudden super hot real estate, and all of a sudden preservation, which had before been kind of this little thing going on, was now bumping heads up. With, one of the, with the most powerful force in, in New York City, which is real estate. Uh, before that, it, was, it wasn't seen as goring anybody's ox. And so that kind of set the stage for a lot of the preservation battles in the 80s and 90s, uh, when preservation was seen as an obstacle to kind of the super development, uh, much of like we're experience at this very moment. Yeah, I mean, we forget. I mean, and, and young people really have no idea about this at all, but there was a time uh, in the living memory of some of us, uh, you know who you are, uh, uh, when you couldn't get a mortgage to buy a house in, you know, many inner city neighborhoods. Now, I think about where I live, which is not the village, alas, it's Park Slope in Brooklyn, and it was, it was down for the count. I mean, the, the banks were all, all they wanted to see was everything basically torn down and replaced by, quote, modern housing. Uh, and it, it was, uh, these neighborhoods were in a desperate situation and preservation uh, really helped change people's perceptions, not least bankers' perceptions. So uh, unsurprisingly, I guess, economics did uh, uh, play a role there. Let me, uh, there's another question that I wanted to ask, which uh, I think both of you might have anticipated a little bit in your presentation, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway, and maybe we can delve a little bit further. Um, uh, the, what do you think the significance of the designation of the Greenwich Village Historic District was in the sense that it was really the first district that was so big and so all-encompassing. On the other hand, as, as Tony, you pointed out, by a lot of people's standards, it had a lot of junk in it. A lot of things that originally um, the thinking was was not the kind of things that you wanted to have uh, in, a, in a district. In fact, I mean, it's funny, in my presentation, I showed the Brevoort, which replaced those historic buildings. The Brevoort actually was in, is in the historic district. Um, although, interestingly, a lot of old buildings uh, were not, um, so how they drew those lines, I'll, I'll never really know or understand. But um, in terms of, the, those were sort of the two most, um, I think, uh, revolutionary things about the Greenwich Village Historic District, as opposed to the, I guess, 10 or so that preceded it, both how big it was and how much stuff it had in it that maybe previously there would have been a, a sort of reluctance to include. Um, what do you think the uh, effect of that was moving forward? I don't, I don't know that it had a, an immediate effect on designation practices, but certainly because there are kind of other 
influences with some of the chairmen changing. For instance, uh, when Beverly Moss Spat became chair, she was focusing more on the outer boroughs and kind of took on smaller discrete districts. But I can tell you, uh, I was involved in the efforts to get the Upper East Side historic district designated in the early 1980s, and there was a huge pushback saying it was this big district, it wasn't homogeneous, it had commercial. And we looked at the village, and which by then was regarded as this iconic, wonderful, tightening net of I mean, kind of an kind of image maybe beyond the specific reality. But we were able to kind of compare the number of building types of different sizes, et cetera, to what the village had. So the village kind of then became like, well, if it was okay with the village, then you know, we, that approach could work for the Upper East Side. And then we got into an era where we had some of the larger districts that were regarded as more a slice of time as opposed to just a heavy density of one architectural style. So I think over time, it's had a very important role kind of inspiring and legitimizing future historic districts.